A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have taken their seat on the chair of Moses. Therefore, do and observe all things whatsoever they tell you, but do not follow their example. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to carry and lay them on people's shoulders, but they will not lift a finger to move them. All their works are performed to be seen. They widen their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love places of honor at banquets, seats of honor in synagogues, greetings in marketplaces, and the salutation rabbi. As for you, do not be called rabbi. You have but one teacher, and you are all brothers. Call no one on earth your father. You have but one father in heaven. Do not be called master. You have but one master, the Christ. The greatest among you must be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we might begin with our prayer to St. Monica. And as, we, and as we begin, just to take a moment to uh, bring someone to mind for whom we'd like the gift of faith. Saint Monica, troubled wife and mother, many sorrows pierced your heart during your lifetime, yet you never despaired or lost faith. With confidence, persistence, and profound faith, you prayed daily for the conversion of your beloved husband, Patricius, and your beloved son, Augustine. Grant me that same fortitude, patience, and trust in the Lord. Intercede for me, dear Saint Monica, for these people. And grant me the grace to accept his will in all things, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I think we can admit that even when we do something good, there's always a little edge of selfishness in it, that we, at the very least, would like to be appreciated for what we do. So some people have this at a very, very low level, a very low level of selfishness, and I think especially of parents who are looking after handicapped children or something like that, a, a very thankless job for years and years, and yet they do it with great love. But still, we all like to be a little bit appreciated, and that's okay. We're, we're never, as human beings, we're never perfectly free of the, the underbelly, you could say, of selfishness, and there's no point in worrying too much about that once we do our best to, to make it as little as possible. I once went to the Holy Land, and on the day I arrived, I went out with some friends to explore the old city in Jerusalem and I remember the afternoon drawing to a close and we got to the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't know how many of you have ever been there but the Garden of Gethsemane has a fine church in it built in the 1920s and you'll be glad to know that in the ceiling there's a nice little American flag in thanks to, to the contributions of the American Catholics to building it. And in this church, around the altar, or where the altar is, there's a rock. And traditionally, that rock is where Jesus knelt on the, that night in Gethsemane when he accepted from the Father the cross for love of you and me. And as I knelt at that rock and prayed, not particularly uh, thinking about anything, I was touched by a little gift from God to know just for a very brief second a sense of the goodness of Jesus as he was there that night. And I would really describe it as a goodness that had no shadow of selfishness whatsoever. That it was a goodness that was absolutely unique without the slightest shadow 
of or tinge of selfishness at all that he offered his life for us there. And St. John the Evangelist, when he writes about the three years that he spent with Jesus, says that the very first thing that he would like to convey to us about those three years, he says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And those words, at all, are very nice in, in Greek because it means literally not one bit that God is light, there is no darkness, not one bit. God is love and goodness and there is no selfishness, not one bit. And on that same night, Jesus took his death, which he was to accomplish the next day on the cross, and he wrapped it up in a meal, as we know. He wrapped it up in the Last Supper. He took bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body given up for you. And the same with the chalice, giving it to his disciples, saying, this is the chalice of my blood poured out for you. And because, of course, Jesus is God, as we say in the creed, he is God from God, light from light, true God from true God. When he says these words, he creates the reality that he, he uh, speaks. Just as God says, let there be light, and there is light. So Jesus says, this is my body, and then it can be no other thing except his body. And within that body and blood, all his death is wrapped up for us 2,000 years later, to be able to, to share in that death and in all the fruits that, that it brings, all the spiritual fruits and salvation that that death brought. So Jesus says at the end to the disciples, do this in memory of me. And then he commands them to do it. But of course, he only commands them because he gives them the power to do it. And so they pass it on as well until you and I here in San Francisco in this Mass can share in the death of Jesus and in the salvation that that brings. I lived in, in Switzerland as well. You know, they, they say, join the Dominicans and see the world. Isn't that right? So I lived in Switzerland once upon a time. And we used to say Mass in a chapel across the road early in the morning, about 7.15. And I remember a winter's morning in the cold and the dark of, of Switzerland in, in the winter. And there was a lady going out down the steps from the chapel in front of me. So, of course, she was delaying me a little bit. And so I took a moment to say good morning to her. And we started chatting. And she told me that she wasn't from that city, but she'd come from another city about half an hour away on the train. And as we were about to part, she said, pray for my son. He took his own life two years ago at the age of 44. And she was obviously very upset by it still, two years later, carrying that great tragedy with her. And tell me this, brothers and sisters, of all the places for her to bring her sorrows and her tragedy on a cold and dark winter's morning, why did she go to Mass? Why did she bring those sorrows with her to Mass? And it's because I think we realize instinctively, or, or supernaturally, of course, the Holy Spirit gives us the grace to realize that the Mass is where Jesus wrapped up his death, that goodness without the slightest shadow of selfishness. And in the Mass, we meet the truest and purest love that we are ever going to meet in this life. So the Mass is true love, a love that reaches beyond the veil of death, smashing death in the resurrection and bringing that love of Jesus on the cross to you and to me, that it's really the only experience of true and untinged love that we experience in this world. So St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a, a great poet as well as a great thinker, used to have a, a huge love of, of the Blessed Sacrament. The Pope asked him to write the prayers and the poetry for the Feast of Corpus Christi, and people who write about it say that when he was doing that, it forced him to think about the Eucharist. And he, you can see his love for the Eucharist growing as he writes these, um, these poems 
And he, he wrote one in particular for himself, and it's called the Adorote Devote. I adore you devoutly, O hidden Godhead. And he says in these lines, Tibi se cor meum totum subjucit. How's your Latin? Getting better fast, is that right? Yeah. So totum subjucit, quia te contemplans totum deficit. Thinking about you, my heart submits itself to you entirely. Because when I think about you, everything fails. So to you, my heart submits itself entirely. Because when I think about you, everything fails. And St. Francis, too, who, wrote, who lived a tiny little bit earlier than St. Thomas, same time as St. Dominic, of course, said, he, he wrote to his friars, he said, I adjure you all to show all reverence and all honor possible to the most holy body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, let the entire man be seized with fear, let the whole world tremble, let heaven exult when Christ, the Son of the living God, is on the altar. O sublime humility that the Lord of the universe, God and the Son of God, so humbles himself that for our salvation he hides himself under a morsel of bread. So a story I like as well is that John Henry Newman, who was one of the great writers in the history of the church, he, he was a Protestant until he was 45, and then after many years of, of searching uh, the, the, the tradition of the church and the scriptures, he became a Catholic. But when he was still an Anglican, he went on holidays in Italy, and while he was there, he got sick, and he was very unhappy. He was all on his own. He was worried about the news he was getting from his beloved England. But later he wrote that in the midst of all that unhappiness, as he walked and toured, he often found a deep peace when he went into the churches. And at the time he didn't know, he just thought it was to do with art or coincidence or something. But later on, when he became a Catholic, he realized that this was God himself reaching out to him in peace. And I'm sure that all of us here, at some stage or other, have felt a sense of peace coming into a church and seeing something, feeling something very beautiful here. And you know, it, it's worth thinking, we can't feel God. God is spirit, and we are physical. So when we feel that peace, what are we feeling? God is creating a feeling of peace in us to welcome us. God is, God is reaching out to us through, uh, through this supernatural sense of peace that we have to draw us to him in the Eucharist. So a wonderful, wonderful thing that the Lord Jesus brings himself to us here in the Mass and at all times in the tabernacle. So at Mass, it's great to remember that we are face to face with the Lord Jesus, face to face with him who raised the daughter of Jairus from the dead, whose garment the woman with the hemorrhage touched and was healed right away. He's here once again for us to teach us the Beatitudes, and he's here with us, the same Lord who on the night before he died wrapped up his death in bread and wine, in the appearance of bread and wine for you and for me. We're here in the presence of the Lord who says to us, come to me all you who labor and are overburdened and I will give you rest. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall not thirst. I am the living bread come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. So with great confidence in the, in the Lord, who has given us so many gifts, let's uh, make our prayer through St. Jude, his apostle. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations and sufferings and particularly this request. and that I may praise God 
with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. Saint Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. <laughs>